This week on the agenda, dealing with debt. Can the world cope as global deficits reach a record high? Global debt is borrowing by governments, businesses and people, and it's at dangerously high levels. It hit a record $307 trillion this year, largely driven by developed countries like the US, Japan, the UK and France. Among emerging markets, the biggest rises came from China, India and Brazil. COVID-19, the soaring cost of living, climate change all play into it, and rising geopolitical tensions, like in the Middle East, might make a bad situation worse. But the UN says the problem is as much about the system as external factors. The global financial architecture makes access to financing inadequate and expensive for developing nations. And that leaves almost half the world, some 3.3 billion people, living in countries that spend more paying interest on their debts than on health and education. Eight of the nine countries the IMF has listed as being in most critical debt distress are in Africa. And since 2010, external debt servicing payments in the continent have more than quadrupled, growing at over 60 times the pace of average fiscal revenues. Joining me now from Lusaka is the Finance Minister of Zambia, Dr. Situnwaka Musakotwami. Thank you very much, Minister, for coming on the agenda. Now, how big an issue is debt for the global south? Is there a bigger issue facing the world right now? It is a big problem uh, for many of us in the south. And uh, of course, I can best describe the situation for Zambia in the sense that uh, with the debt mountain that we had, we had very little money to spend on key social services such as health, education, and uh, also on infrastructure. If you went around the country, you'd see many uh, sites for schools, hospitals, roads that had to be abandoned midway because there was not enough money to continue um, building this. And that was all because of uh, uh, debt. I believe uh, many of uh, other countries here in Africa that are facing the same problem, but I think uh, those that have been in the news, have been in the news, I will hesitate to mention any. Now, in 2020, Zambia became the first African nation to default on its debt payments during the, the COVID pandemic. You've agreed new repayment terms with state creditors of up to $6.3 billion in debt, including over $4 billion owed to China. It's given you quite a lot of breathing space, but the hard work isn't over yet, is it? Well, there are still some formalities that we need to go through, but I'm happy that uh, the key aspect of this, the first one being to agree that debt restructuring will take place, of course, with the agreement of the creditors, and uh, secondly, the support coming around from various uh, organizations such as the IMF, the World Bank, African Development Bank, and the bilateral uh, creditor countries. Uh, so we have that essential in place. Where we are now, um, we just recently agreed on the Memorandum of Understanding, mm. which is a piece of document that commits all of us, the creditors and us, the debtors, to the key aspects, key features of the debt restructuring. Yeah. Um, so we are just going through the process of getting that signed by the various creditors. Um, so I think we are good because everybody is committed to this. And uh, the observers, the private sector out there, they are taking notice and that is important. So yes, yeah. we've gone quite a long way along this road. Now the IMF says that more than 100 countries face making cuts on vital services like education, like healthcare. What can those countries learn from what Zambia has done? I think for us the most important thing was not to hide 
our heads in the sand. If you have a problem, the first thing to do is to recognize that you have a problem, admit there is a problem, and that sets you uh, towards a solution. Because if you pretend you don't have a problem, how do you get a solution? So the very first thing is to admit you have a problem, reach out to international institutions, because most of this debt typically um, tends to be across various creditors. So reach out to international institutions. And for us, we reach out to the official creditors committee uh, through the common framework. The common framework is the arrangement that is in place, which says if a country owes a number of creditors and uh, is struggling, what kind of support mechanism do we have to lead it to a solution outside this problem. So um, we reached out, we talked about our problem, yeah. the reception was good, and after that, we've been working towards a solution. And of course, the third point I would put is there must be serious seriousness and commitment. Yeah. Because if you are going to go out seeking the support of people, it is you who is looking for the solution to demonstrate seriousness. That seriousness includes um, working together with the creditors, international bodies, the kind of reform program that you need to put in place, which is with the support of the various uh, uh, institutions, will lead you out of the problem. So there must be seriousness so that you can convince both the creditors and the supporters that you mean well you are serious. So that yeah. is very important. And after that, you stick to that. Yeah. And this is what we've been doing in the last uh, two and a half years. Yeah. And uh, here we are. I yeah. think we have uh, mm. achieved a lot. As well as reforms, you, you've also been looking into diversification. Um, and as the world gears up for the green transition, you're hoping that it's going to boost demand for Zambia's copper reserves. That will provide crucial foreign investment. So tell me about the plans that you've got in Zambia to maximise copper production to address the country's debt issue. Absolutely, because the debt restructuring does provide relief, yes, but it is not the ultimate because the people of Zambia, most of whom are young, they are not just looking forward to debt relief. The ultimate goal that they have is to have their lives to be improved. And that is also our goal as government. And I believe also that uh, for the those who are supporting us, the international community, they also want to see a prosperous Zambia. So that problems that we see sometimes, like people uh, migrating illegally to the north, uh, looking for jobs or whatever they call it, we minimize those aspects of possible instability to the world. So for us, we have been very lucky because right now, there is this opportunity that is coming in front of us, arising from the fact that people want to decarbonize our world. And in doing so, the resources that we have are an answer to that. Decarbonization means people using more and more copper, for example, in the motor industry, uh, less of internal combustion engine to electric cars. What is in the electric car engine? It is copper. Who has the copper? Well, we are one of those with the copper. So we are asking, um, uh, asking investors come and mine with us, come and value add with us, not just copper. Issues of other vital minerals for this, such as nickel, cobalt, manganese, all those are important in decarbonizing the world and we have the resources. So really our job is to create an environment that is conducive to the private sector to come and invest 
take advantage of the resources, take advantage of the market opportunities surrounding these minerals, and bang, the economy should be able to pick up. Development always costs money. I mean, is there any way for the Global South to build this infrastructure that it desperately needs without entering a debt trap? We have learned our lessons about debt, infrastructure and debt. So as far as this government is concerned, uh, there is no way in which we are going to drift back into debt. Yes, taking advantage of the situation now, the global economic situation and opportunities, it requires infrastructure. But we have also learned that this infrastructure can be financed by the private sector. So with the fact that uh, mineral production is going to rise in the next few years, but the fact that agricultural production is going to rise, it becomes easy for us to approach the private sector and convince them and say to them, look, there will be millions of tons of copper coming out of this place. It requires evacuation to the ports. Can you come and build roads? Can you come and build railways? Can you come and build ports? That becomes possible, it becomes feasible. Dr. Situbaka Musa Kutwami, thank you very much. Pleasure is mine. Thank you so much indeed. So that's the view from one African nation. But what about the wider global picture? Joining me now to look at the world's debts is Vita Gasper, Director of the Fiscal Affairs Department at the IMF. What would you say are the main factors behind the spike we're seeing in global debt? So as, uh, as you well know, global debt spiked in 2020, the year of the pandemic, and that jump up of a global debt was the largest on record. Then uh, in 2021 and 2022, it declined actually quite fast. Those are also the largest declines on record. And that was associated with the recovery from the pandemic, surprise inflation, and of course, the uh, withdrawal of the exceptional measures of support, which were necessary during uh, the pandemic. But now, as you rightly say, in 2023, global public debt is uh, turning up again, and uh, one can attribute that to uh, the uh, turnaround uh, in the United States and the contribution of uh, China. And if one would not take into account these two largest economies in the world, uh, public debt would actually be declining. In the medium term, uh, global public debt is projected to increase by about one percentage point a year until the end of our projection uh, horizon and at that pace it would go above a hundred percent of global gdp by the end of the decade without the us and china the rest of the world would actually have a declining mm. debt by about half a percentage point per year so look global debt is projected to jump even further I mean, if it's happening everywhere um, to everyone should we be concerned? I mean, what, talk us through the, the potential consequences. So it's not uh, happening everywhere. It's not happening uh, to everyone. As I said before, the main drivers of global public debt developments are the US and China. These two largest economies are also economies that have a very large uh, policy space. So both uh, the US and uh, China have multiple options uh, to put their debt path under control under unchanged uh, policies. The projection is that public debt ratios would continue to increase both uh, in the US and uh, China. In the world, you actually see that most countries project declining uh, public debt 
to GDP ratios, there are countries in the world right now which uh, face very binding uh, financing constraints. They face uh, dramatic uh, cash constraints and therefore they are forced by markets and their capacity to generate uh, domestic uh, revenue, they're forced to retrench and they face often uh, very dramatic priorities uh, when it comes to public spending. One of the aspects that the IMF is concerned with is uh, food security and that gives you an idea of how dramatic the mm. trade-offs for the countries in this group can be. You talk about market forces. You've also mentioned the the impact, ongoing impact um, of um, the, the COVID-19 pandemic. I wonder, though, what the effect of new vulnerabilities um, might be to the global system, like the conflict um, in Israel and heightened tensions in the Middle East. So uh, it's, um, we regret uh, very much the uh, loss of life, uh, both uh, in uh, Israel and Gaza. Uh, we regret in particular the effects that the conflict is having on uh, civilian uh, populations. In terms of specific estimates of economic and financial impacts, it's a premature uh, to do it right now. We do see some impacts on energy markets, uh, in particular oil. We also see um, some developments in uh, financial markets, particularly bond markets, but to repeat, uh, it's premature to go for any quantification. Still, I think that the example that you give of a world where uh, multiple disturbances occur and where the public expects governments uh, to act as uh, insurers, as protectors, as supporters, is a world where it is necessary to have uh, sound uh, public finances so that governments have the financial muscle that allows them to respond to a multiplicity of shocks. Let's talk about possible solutions um, to tackle global debt. And the real buzz at the moment is AI, artificial intelligence. I mean, do you think that tech innovation can have a meaningful impact on reducing debt levels? So th that's a very uh, interesting uh, question. I'm pretty sure that many people on the show have uh, spoken to you about fintech and the possibilities that technology opens in the financial uh, system. Uh, we are very much emphasizing uh, golf tech, the application of uh, um, technology in uh, public administration and we have put out a staff discussion note in September that looks at golf tech developments and possibilities all around the world. You're absolutely right that uh, technology allows for uh, better efficiency in uh, public spending. There are very good examples in, around the world of uh, better targeting, targeting of public um, spending by use of technology. Uh, India is a very good example. Many countries in Africa did it very well uh, to uh, support populations during the course of the pandemic, but technology also improves the information that is available uh, to uh, tax policy decision makers, to tax administrations, and so it uh, allows for a more efficient and effective tax system. So both on the spending side, spend better, and on the revenue side, collect uh, more, collect more efficiently. Uh, GovTech does uh, contribute to better public finance management and therefore to reduce public finance uh, pressures and bring uh, public debt developments under control. Vita Casper, thank you very much. Thank you.
Still to come here on the agenda. The view from China. We'll hear how that country's coping with an increasing debt burden. We are all connected. Across borders. Across continents. Connected by ideas. A shared humanity. Stay connected. Welcome back to the agenda. China recently announced a new 1 trillion yuan or 137 billion US dollar debt plan in one of the biggest changes to the national budget in years. So what does that tell us about China's approach to debt? Joining me now from Beijing is Michael Pettis, Professor of Finance at Peking University's Guanghua School of Management. Thanks for coming on the agenda. Now, why is debt rising? in China. Consumption in China is extremely low, perhaps the lowest we've ever seen as a share of GDP uh, in history. And so in order when consumption is low, by definition, investment must be high. And for many years, uh, all of this investment in China was very good for the economy because China was hugely underinvested. But in the past decade or so, as China's closed the gap, between the investment it has and the investment it needs, this over-reliance on investment has resulted in a surge in debt, largely because a lot of this investment is non-productive. So as a result, uh, the discussions about debt are also discussions about the nature and structure of Chinese uh, infrastructure investment. So what you're saying is that the debt in China it is structural and, in fact, necessary to, to the way the economy operates? Yeah, it, it's, it's structural in the sense that um, uh, there are two main sources of growth for any economy, consumption and investment. And so by definition, when consumption is very low, investment must be very high. Um, and the problem is that in China, a lot of investment has been directed not to accommodate growth, but to create growth, to create um, mm. economic activity. The sort of classic case has become the province of Guizhou, which, as you know, is a relatively poor province. The per capita income in Guizhou is not much higher than, say, in Cambodia. But Guizhou has some of the uh, highest and most spectacular bridges in the world. Um, the question is, uh, uh, is the economy, does the economy benefit from having such beautiful, expensive bridges? And typically, you would argue that if, if Guizhou were a rich province, a very high productivity province, all of that investment in infrastructure would be justified. But as a poor province, it's much harder to justify. And the result is you end up building infrastructure that is better than what the economy can absorb uh, productively. Well, let's talk about that big change in the national budget that we've seen from, from China this year, the issuance of that one trillion yuan or 137 billion dollars in government bonds. Why did that happen and why is it important? That's happened as part of a very difficult and at times contentious debate about um, who is going to absorb the cost of, of resolving local government debt. Uh, it won't surprise you to hear, Juliet, that local governments would like Beijing to take on a bigger share. So, for example, Beijing can borrow money and use the proceeds directly or indirectly to help the local governments. Uh, Beijing, on the other hand, has said, and, and in my opinion correctly, that they're very reluctant to take on the cost of resolving the debt of the local governments. They want the local governments to resolve it themselves. But that's quite hard to do. So my interpretation of this one trillion increase in borrowing is sort of a partial step to give local governments more time to figure out how they're going to resolve their own debt problems. And what would you say the broader economic impact is going to be of those extra government bonds on the broader economy? 
Well, um, the, the, the claim is that the proceeds will be used for infrastructure spending, particularly disaster relief and things like that. Um, that's all necessary expenditure. It's quite important for the economy. Um, but the real question for me is how much larger will this eventually be? Because the amount of debt that local governments need simply to pay off the existing debt is much more than a trillion renminbi. These are very, very large numbers. So the way I would see this is that this is a partial step towards creating space for a perhaps more vigorous, more robust discussion of what ultimately will be done to resolve local government debt. And how would you say China's approach is different to, to other major economies when it comes to managing their debt? Other economies like the United States, for example? Well, in the US, I would argue that the surge in debt reflects um, the, the, uh, the transfer of income to support consumption. Mm. Um, and in China, the surge in debt reflects the transfer of income to support investment. The irony is that the U.S. doesn't have a consumption problem. It has an investment problem that is insufficient investment. And China doesn't have a problem of insufficient investment. It has a problem of insufficient consumption. So both, both countries are, in a way, resolving the other country's problem. And that's why in both countries you're seeing debt rise so quickly. Would you say that China is more sensitive to external demand, to, to, to trade conflicts than, say, the United States, Japan, the United Kingdom? Well, um, Japan not so much, but certainly the United States and the United Kingdom. Um, you have to remember that countries that run surpluses and, and persistent surpluses, and China's is the largest in the world, perhaps the largest in history, um, run surpluses because of very weak domestic demand. In other words, they cannot consume domestically everything they produce. So the purpose of the surplus is to allow them to externalize that weak demand. So that makes them very sensitive to changes in foreign demand. And I think that's something that, uh, that uh, uh, the authorities in Beijing are increased concerned about, but it's very difficult to resolve it. China's economy remains on track uh, for Beijing's target of around 5% growth this year. That is below more optimistic forecasts um, that, that they had at the start of the year. I mean, what kind of policy push do you think it's going to take to push the dial? We're already seeing it. I think in the beginning of the year, many of us were expecting uh, growth to be closer to 6% than to 5%. Um, the very weak domestic demand in the first half of the year caused everybody to cut their growth forecasts. And I think they probably cut them too much, and we're now starting to see people readjust their forecasts upward. But you know, in, in China, um, there are two very different ways of thinking about growth. There's the GDP growth rate, and there's also the quality of growth. And uh, you hear a lot of um, uh, policy uh, makers and policy advisors talk more about the quality of growth rather than the quantity of growth. And I think that's really the issue that we need to think about for the rest of this year and next year. It's not so much will China grow at 4% or at 5%, but how high quality will that growth be? Michael Pettis, thank you very much. Thank you. You can watch every episode of The Agenda in full on CGTN Europe's YouTube channel. And for exclusive extra content from me, my guests and the rest of the team, don't forget to check out at The Agenda Show on TikTok. Coming up on a future agenda. The EU goes to Beijing. We'll examine Ursula von der Leyen's visit to China. But for now, from me, Juliet Mann, and from all the Agenda team here in London, goodbye.